Good evening, St. Martin, and those who are uh, tuning in. This is uh, part of our, what would be our usual Wednesday night services. And so we are trying to make available to you uh, the scripture readings and also the uh, the sermon which is available. And as many of you will probably be having uh, the devotions at home and maybe singing along with it, uh, our first hymn that we would have been singing would have been uh, 705, The Man is Ever Blessed. Uh, so if you want to follow along, that would have been that. Uh, the second hymn that we would have sung would, would have been uh, Lord, Thee I Love with All My Heart, which is 708. And then the one that is the sermon hymn, the one that uh, closely uh, follows along with the scripture readings and the sermon, would have been 691, Fruitful Trees, the Spirit's Sowing. And so that would be a great one to be able to sing along with. And then also uh, for the Lenten season as well, we have uh, 454, uh, Seeing My Tongue, the Glorious Battle. So for those who would like to participate with that, you certainly may. We'll continue then with uh, the readings that we have for this evening, uh, which is then for our Old Testament reading, we have Isaiah chapter 5, beginning with verse 7. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and he hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there for me to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield uh, grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading is from Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 1, and then from verse 13 to the end of the chapter. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. 
This is the word of the Lord. And our uh, gospel reading, which is also the main basis for the sermon text, is from Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. This is the Gospel of the Lord. As we uh, move on to the sermon, let us go ahead and pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we continue living among the Bible's trees, tonight we consider two trees, unspecific according to their species, but very specific according to their essence, the very core of what is their substance. We consider the, the very whatness of the tree by the fruit that it bears. It is not as though that we're talking about apples or oranges, figs or even grapes. Just don't go bananas and thinking about every fruit that you might see at the grocers. We're looking at the nature of the fruit that intrinsic quality uh, that we would meet God's standards of acceptability, that very whatness that reveals the nature of a person's soul. So let us consider uh, the good trees bearing good fruit and the bad trees bearing bad fruit, that we would realize that though we are by nature bad trees bearing bad fruit, God changes us into good trees bearing good fruit. Now, as we consider the, the goodness or the badness, we can sometimes be at a disadvantage to judge. Just as you may go to the store or go into your garden to pick some fruit, knowing what is good can also be a little bit tricky. Whether you're evaluating the fruit by its color the shape, the plumpness, or even the, the sound when you give it a thump. Is it firm or is it soft? And sometimes that criteria can be a little misleading. A bright red strawberry can be hard and bitter, or a yellow banana could be hard and starchy, or even bruised and mushy, or even have little seedlings beginning to sprout inside of it. And just how many black spots can you have on the outside of that banana before it's gone a little bit beyond what we would consider good? And I think the most tricky of things to be able to determine whether it is or isn't good are avocados. Just how much green can you have? Or the same goes for how much dark is too dark. Is it soft because it's good or because it was squeezed a, a few too many times? and then you go to cut it open and pull out the pit and it just doesn't even budge. And then, who knows, maybe it's soft because the inside has gone rotten. With so many different criterion, how do you know? Whose criteria is right when your mom says one thing and maybe the farmer, the grocer, the chef, or even your friend all say something different from each other? From whom do you learn the truth? And it is this last question that is the right question when it comes to considering Jesus' tale of two trees, the good tree bearing good fruit and the bad tree bearing bad fruit. Whose word, whose teaching, and whose standard are you using? In the beginning, God created trees bearing fruit according to their kind. And of all of the trees, of only one did God set aside not to be eaten. The standard of goodness was not 
what was pleasing to the eye, as was the forbidden fruit, nor was it uh, whether it was good for food or not, because the forbidden fruit was also good for food. Nor was it in the benefit of gaining knowledge, for God had set his creation apart from the knowledge and even the existence of evil. What was good and what was bad was only known according to the standard that God himself established, the very criteria that he spoke to his creation, and is continually taught by created men, repeating that very word of God and his standards of good and evil. And as Jesus talks about good trees bearing good fruit and bad trees bearing bad fruit, Jesus isn't talking about fruits and vegetables that you get from the store or the marketplace. He's talking about people. So as we consider a good tree bearing good fruit and a bad tree bearing bad fruit, what criteria are we to use? You can't experience a person's soul as you do a piece of fruit. You cannot tell by a person's color. God created all colors into one human race, and he died to save all. You can give them a squeeze, but a hug isn't how you're going to be able to tell whether or not they are bearing fruit in keeping with the Holy Spirit. And I highly advise against you uh, smelling or even thumping your neighbor. At best, it's kind of weird, and at worst, it might even be illegal, right? You don't want to hit somebody. So as you consider a good tree bearing good fruit and a bad tree bearing bad fruit, what criteria are you going to use? So rather than coming up with all the fruity ideas that we can possibly imagine as criteria for goodness or badness, what did Jesus say? Listen again to Jesus' words. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. So often we judge by the external criteria, and that would lead us to see a false prophet as being one of God's sheep and not a ravenous wolf. Like Eve, who saw that forbidden fruit and saw it as something good and not evil or sinful and death that came with it. What is the fruit of a prophet? It is not the miracles. It is not the signs and wonders. These only accompany the fruit and confirms the fruit's authenticity. Pharaoh's magicians and other sorcerers like Simon Magnus or even today's modern magicians or mentalists are also able to amaze our senses and deceive us through their arts to believe the story that they are putting before our eyes. Lucifer and his legions are able to bear false light. False light is the very meaning of the name Lucifer. And they're able to foretell futures, as we see in the book of Acts, or even break the chains of bondage and lead men astray to believe in their power and abilities and then the word and message that they speak rather than us listening to God's word and finding faith and belief in it. Against all of these other things, Jesus gives us the warning to beware of false prophets. And Peter shares more plainly that we would know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. The proof or the fruit of the prophet is in what he says. A prophet is a teacher. Both use words to tell others what they have been told. But for us, 
The question to consider concerning good and bad fruit is, is the word they believe, teach, and confess a true and faithful teaching according to God's word? And one can only judge rightly if they are in God's word to know what it is that God has said. And com this then comes from outside of ourselves. It does not come from our hearts or our minds. And due to the evil eating of that forbidden fruit, sin and death has entered into, cre into creation. Now, each person is conceived and born into that destruction. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. We belong to and are the fruit of that tree from which we descended, and that is sin. And just to clarify, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil and its fruit, they're not evil. The tree was not made to be evil. God did not create evil. Evil enters into creation by way of sin, that is human disobedience. It was the false teaching that was employed into the action contrary to God's revealed will, and that is evil. Sin produces sin. We are naturally born as bad fruit of a bad tree that is, our fallen and sinful human nature. Our very whatness is now broken and a tarnished nature that is contrary to the goodness that God had originally created us to bear. The word of both bad and diseased, as we have it in our English, is the very same word in the Greek. It has more of a meaning of, of rotten, and often ill intention or evil. And our word diseased is pretty nice in the sense that uh, a, a disease, even a congenital disease, describes our nature. It is our whatness as being rotten, all the while holding into tension and the contrast of our created nature that was good. Humanity itself is not rotten, but our fallen humanity is. Adam and Eve were created in humanity that was not sinful, nor was or is Christ sinful by taking on and being part of humanity in his human flesh. Our Old Testament reading from Isaiah speaks of the goodness that God created and planted in the vineyard, and yet, his people produced wild grapes. That word wild in the Greek scrolls is the very same word that Jesus used to describe the diseased tree and the bad fruit. Though we were originally created good and righteous, humanity now has this additional unnatural nature that is diseased and rotten and sinful. By nature, our human flesh is fallen into sin and continues to produce sin. Jesus teaches us, But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. And in our epistle reading, Paul tells us uh, that now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, that is heresies actually, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And among the list that Paul uh, has, he highlights divisions. And as I said, that is the word heresies. And we had also heard that earlier when I had quoted uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, which is, 
But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. A tree's goodness or badness is known according to the standard of its fruit. That is, its teaching being the very same as God's teaching. And another word for teaching is doctrine. God's doctrine must be our doctrine. Otherwise, we fall into the sin of false doctrine, which is heresy. False teaching is the root that produces the actions of sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, heresies, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And so it should be really no surprise that we do see these things among Christians and even whole church bodies calling evil good and good evil, even though this is not proper according to the true church. Paul even dealt with these issues at Corinth, saying in 1 Corinthians 11, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions, that is, heresies, among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. The church stands and falls on doctrine. Allowing false doctrine amid the church is like welcoming COVID into your family. The harm that it causes is so great. It disrupts the unity of coming together as a people of God. Unfortunately, we tend to be more tolerant and accepting of heresies than we see, or the heresies that we do see, than over our zealousness against the germs that we cannot see and may not even be there at all. If only we had the very same compassion for those afflicted with coronavirus and the the faithful vigilance to stand up against heresies and to teach rightly even to those who pronounce false doctrine, that we would then be recognized as genuine. How does the Bible say that we are to interact with false teachers, those who are persisting in doctrine? Well, let's see. From Titus chapter 3. As for a person who stirs up division, that is heresies, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, and he is self-condemned. In short, we follow Matthew 18. And if John the baptizer said then, even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees, every tree therefore that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. How much more ought we to hear the truth and respond in faith in these latter days? You cannot have a good and faithful life with false teachings. Good teaching, however, can begin the renewal of life, leading to a fruitful life. For good teaching is none other than that life-giving word of God now come to the hearer and producing a life lived in the very word of God made flesh. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Our loving creator looks upon that vineyard of his creation and the bad fruit that it is producing and he provided new life amid destruction. He takes us, the bad branches bearing bad fruit, and he cuts us down from that bad tree, and he severs us from sin and death. 
and this can sometimes be painful and hurt our pride. But then he inserts us into his pierced side that flowed with blood and water, and he grafts us into the very tree of the cross, baptizing us and forgiving us of our rotten fruit. The evil shall be destroyed and consumed in the fires of hell. But for those whom he transplants into the tomb of Jesus, we arise by faith into a new life in Jesus the vine. Have you ever seen a, a branch that has been grafted into another tree? If not, Google it or look it up on YouTube. You can see how this new life has amazing effects, say of a, a cucumber being grafted with a, a watermelon vine, or look up the, the tree of 40 fruit. As wonderful as the science of horticulture can be, he, <clears throat> Jesus, grafts us and grafts you into himself and there he adopts you as his own baptized child. And there he supplies you with everything that you need, taking away from you and into himself every bad and evil and sin and disease and rottenness that he then is able to then give to you the very works that he bears uh, through you, through the fruit, that is the fruit of the Spirit. He gives to you love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And against such things there is no law. Considering the good trees bearing good fruit and the bad trees bearing bad fruit, we realize that though we are by nature bad trees bearing bad fruit, God changes us into good trees bearing good fruit. Amen. Let us pray. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are the good teacher, and we look to you for every word that is profitable for us. Remove from us all that is bad, even though it may be inherent to our sinful nature. We know that according to our new birth through the waters of holy baptism, that you give to us new life, that we may be able to bear the good fruit of the Holy Spirit and have that in abundance, so that on the last day we may stand before you, maybe not realizing all the good works that we have done before you, that we may live with you and your people forever into the mystical communion of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you all as you uh, go through this Lenten season, and be with us again as we uh, participate and uh, celebrate uh, Palm Sunday and Easter, which is just around the corner. Peace be with you.